In 1968, British railway engineers watched with disbelief as a steam locomotive many called outdated, derided for its 10 massive wheels, charged past the fastest diesel trains in official trials. Conventional wisdom said this design was overbuilt, wasteful, and doomed to failure. But the truth was stranger. The locomotive's supposed flaw became its greatest weapon, exposing a fatal error in the very plan to make steam obsolete. Why did the authorities ignore what their own data was telling them, and what could make a nation scrap its most brilliant freight engine just as it broke every expectation? In 1954, British railways faced a dilemma that seemed almost anachronistic in a world already turning to diesel and electric power. The network still depended on moving thousands of tons of coal, ore, and goods across routes that ranged from flat main lines to twisting, lightly built branches. The board's solution was both bold and, to some, baffling. They authorized the design and construction of a new heavy freight steam locomotive, the British Railway Standard Class 9F. The project's architect, R.A. Riddles, brought years of experience in wartime logistics and locomotive engineering to the task. He had already proven the value of the 2 10 0 wheel arrangement with the War Department austerity engines, and now he saw a chance to push the concept further. Riddles and his team were given a clear mandate. Create a locomotive powerful enough to haul 900-ton trains at 35 miles per hour, but gentle enough on the rails to be used across much of the aging British network. The answer was a 10-coupled giant, five driving axles, a 250 pounds per square inch boiler, and two outside cylinders, all riding on a frame designed for strength and stability. The design was ambitious, even radical, for a country already eyeing the end of steam. Critics inside and outside the railway called it overbuilt, a throwback a machine destined to be outdated before it even left the works. Yet the board approved the plan, betting that R.A. Riddle's vision would deliver the reliable freight power the system still desperately needed. The first Class 9F entered service in 1954, a physical statement that, for all the talk of progress, the demands of Britain's freight still called for the most advanced steam engineering the country could muster. Production of the Class 9F was anything but tentative. British Railways placed orders for 251 locomotives, a commitment that stretched the resources of two major works, Crewe in the north and Swindon in the west. Both facilities operated at full capacity, turning out engines in parallel to meet the demands of a network still dependent on heavy mineral traffic. The scale of this undertaking was impossible to ignore. Each locomotive required thousands of hours of skilled labor, tons of steel, and precision assembly, all at a time when the official policy was already shifting toward diesel and electric traction. The press, never short on opinions, labeled the program a monument to overbuilding, with one columnist quipping that the 9F seemed to have wheels enough for two engines. Despite the skepticism, the build rate stayed brisk. Output logs from Crewe and Swindon show long runs of Class 9F locomotives rolling out between 1954 and 1960, with batches sometimes completed in as little as a few months. The investment in tooling, parts, and assembly lines was substantial, signaling that British Railways was not hedging its bets, at least not yet. For every engine dispatched, there was the implicit question, would this massive fleet pay off, or would it become a casualty of the coming diesel era? As the last units left the works, the answer was far from clear. The sheer number of locomotives and the industrial effort behind them set the stage for a reckoning, one that would hinge not just on design, but on the realities of a system in transition. The foundation of the Class 9F's reputation, whether admired or doubted, came down to its running gear. At first glance, the 210 wheel arrangement looked excessive for British tracks. 
where tight curves and weight restrictions were a constant concern. Yet every element of the design had a specific purpose. Five coupled driving axles spread the locomotive's weight over a greater length, bringing the maximum axle load down to just under 16 tons. For a machine expected to haul 900-ton trains, this was a remarkable achievement. It meant the 9F could run on lines where heavier freight engines would have been banned, all without overburdening the rails. The design team faced a classic problem, how to get a long, rigid wheelbase around the sharp curves common on British routes. The solution was both subtle and effective. The center driving axle was built without flanges, allowing it to slide sideways through curves instead of binding against the rails. On the second and fourth axles, the flanges were made shallower, further reducing the risk of excessive wear. This combination let the 9F handle curves as tight as a 400-foot radius, an impressive feat for such a large locomotive. Balancing adhesion with track friendliness was a constant calculation. Too much weight on too few wheels would damage the rails. Too little and the locomotive would slip under load. By distributing adhesive weight across all five driven axles, the 9F achieved a stable footing. The risk of wheel slip was minimized, even when starting heavy trains on wet rails. This careful distribution did not just protect the track. It allowed the 9F to maintain higher speeds safely. Something few expected from a 10-coupled freight engine, the physical layout was more than a matter of brute force. It was a calculated response to Britain's aging infrastructure, an answer to the challenge of moving ever heavier trains without overstepping the limits of the network. In the process, the design team laid the groundwork for a locomotive that would prove unexpectedly agile and sure-footed, setting the stage for the surprising performance that would follow. The real secret to the Class 9F's surprising performance lay deep within its steam circuit. At the heart of the locomotive, a boiler operating at 250 pounds per square inch delivered a steady torrent of high-pressure steam to two massive cylinders, each 20 inches in diameter, with a stroke of 28 inches. This combination was chosen not for show, but for relentless, repeatable power, enough to produce a tractive effort of nearly 39,700 pounds force a figure that eclipsed many earlier freight designs. The boiler itself was a study in efficiency. Engineers raised the firebox slightly to clear the rear coupled axle, sacrificing a bit of great area, but gaining a free steaming high output core that could keep up with the relentless demand of loaded trains. But power alone was not enough. The 9F's designers focused on how steam moved through the engine, how it was admitted, expanded, and exhausted. Standard wall shirts valve gear, paired with piston valves, gave precise control over steam admission. This meant the timing of each valve event could be tuned for both brute force at low speeds and efficient, sustained horsepower as the pace increased. On later engines, a double chimney replaced the original single stack. This refinement allowed exhaust steam to escape more freely, reducing back pressure in the cylinders. The result was that the engine could breathe easier at speed, converting more of each pound of coal into forward motion. Even under heavy load, the 9F's boiler and valve system kept up. The locomotive could sustain high indicated horsepower for long periods, a trait that became clear during long runs with 900-ton trains. Optimized valve events ensured that steam was used efficiently through a wide range of speeds, while the double chimney made sure that the cylinders never choked, even as the regulator was opened wide. These features did not just make the 9F strong, they made it fast. When crews pushed these engines, the steam circuit responded with a smooth, almost effortless surge, keeping the locomotive in its power band long after other freight engines would have begun to falter. This blend of high-pressure steam, careful drafting, and precise valve timing formed the technical backbone for the locomotive's later feats, allowing a machine built for slow, heavy work to rival the speed and stamina of brand new diesels. On a damp morning in the late 1950s, 
a Class 9F backs onto a waiting line of mineral wagons, 50, sometimes 60 cars, stretching nearly half a mile. The guard's lamp signals ready. The driver, a veteran of heavy freight, glances at the trial sheet. The consist tips the scales at just over 900 tons. This was the figure Riddles and his team had set as the benchmark, a load many believed would leave even a modern steam engine struggling. With the regulator eased open, the Class 9F responds without drama. Five driving axles grip the rails, distributing more than 78 tons of adhesive weight. There is no frantic wheel slip, only a steady surge as the train begins to move. Timetables for these heavy mineral drags were set with little margin for error. Maintaining 35 miles per hour with this kind of burden was no small feat, especially on undulating routes where gradients could sap momentum in an instant. Yet the firemen on the 9F, shovel flashing in the firebox, glow, keeps the pressure steady at 250 pounds per square inch. The boiler, engineered for relentless output, delivers a constant supply of steam to the cylinders. As the train climbs a gentle bank, the crew watches the pressure gauge and listens for any sign of strain. The locomotive holds its pace. The exhaust beats strong and even. Trial records from crew and Swindon confirm what the crews already know. The 9F hauls 900-ton trains at schedule, not just once, but day after day. On the timing sheets, arrival times match the printed schedule sometimes even gaining a minute or two on favorable stretches. Drivers note the smooth ride, the absence of pounding or sway, even with the full weight behind them. Firemen report that the engine steams freely, rarely dropping below the mark. These are not theoretical numbers. They are the lived experience of footplate crews tasked with moving Britain's heaviest freight. In the depots, word spreads quickly the new 10 coupled engines are not just meeting the design brief, they are making it look easy. For all the skepticism about too many wheels, the 9F proves itself where it counts, on the load sheets, in the logbooks, and in the quiet satisfaction of crews who know what it means to keep a 900-ton train on time. Evening Star, the last of the 9F locomotives, carried a reputation that stretched far beyond its commemorative green paint. On the main line, its speed runs became the stuff of legend among railway men and enthusiasts alike. Official timing logs and dynamometer sheets from its late service years record a feat few would have believed possible for a freight locomotive, sustained speeds exceeding 90 miles per hour. The numbers told a story that no amount of skepticism could erase. Here was a 210 zero wheel arrangement built for cold drags matching or outpacing express passenger schedules on stretches of Western Region track. Press columns that once poked fun at the 9F's 10 wheels now found themselves scrambling for explanations. Railway Magazine, in a 1960 review, described Evening Star's performance as remarkably smooth and sure-footed at speeds well beyond her intended bracket. Drivers reported a sensation of effortless acceleration the locomotive gliding over the rails with a steadiness that belied its size. There was no speedometer fitted, but footplate crews relied on milepost timing and the rhythm of the exhaust. One recalled, she ran so smoothly at high speeds that you just let her go as fast as felt safe. Enthusiasts lined the embankments to witness Evening Star's final mainline turns, aware they were seeing not just the last of British rail steam, but a machine rewriting the rules in its closing act. The locomotive's preservation was already assured by the time she took her farewell run, but her legacy was still being written in real time. Years later, preservation volunteers would prove the point again. In 1982, 92203, another 9F now named Black Prince, hauled a 2,178-ton train at Foster Yeoman Quarry setting a record for the heaviest load ever moved by steam in Britain. The data was clear. What began as a so-called overbuilt relic had become a benchmark for power and speed, celebrated both in the press and on the rails. Evening Star's story 
and the feats of her sisters gave the lie to every prediction that too many wheels meant too little performance. In January 1955, British Railways published the Modernization and Re-Equipment Plan, a document that would shape every major decision for the next decade. The plan set out a sweeping agenda, replace steam with diesel and electric power, overhaul workshops, modernize yards, and streamline the entire network. At its core was a promise. Within 15 years, steam would be gone from Britain's main lines. The language was clear and confident. Diesel traction was described as the essential bridge to a fully electrified future, and the plan called for the purchase of around 2,500 mainline diesel locomotives in the first 10 years alone. Cost tables projected billions in long-term savings from slashing maintenance hours, closing dozens of steam depots, and reducing the need for coal, water, and heavy overhauls. The British Transport Commission and the new BR Board saw dieselization not just as a technical upgrade, but as a public commitment to progress. Policy documents stressed the need for a modern image, one that could compete with cars, trucks, and air travel. Every new diesel order was justified with charts and forecasts, fewer breakdowns, higher availability, a leaner workforce. The timetable for STEAM's withdrawal was not just ambitious. It was locked into government budgets and management targets. Even as new standard STEAM locomotives rolled out of Swindon and Crewe, the machinery of change was already in motion. The plan's logic left little room for exceptions. No matter how well a STEAM engine performed, the future was to be diesel, and the numbers on paper left no space for sentiment or second thoughts. Withdrawal notices arrived in waves, each one shrinking the Class 9F's world a little more. By 1968, not a single 9F remained in British Railways service. The entire fleet, 251 strong at its peak, vanished into scrapyards in less than 15 years, many before their paint had faded, some after barely a decade of work. Workshop records from Crewe and Swindon show engines lined up for cutting, their mileage totals a fraction of what designers had projected. Fitters and drivers watched as engines they had only just come to trust were condemned, their robust frames and powerful boilers, now liabilities in a system chasing diesel efficiency. There was no ceremony, only a relentless schedule. Withdrawal lists from the final years read like a roll call. 92000092001 Each name was ticked off and each engine dispatched to the torch, yet the story did not end in total erasure. Against the tide, a handful of 9Fs escaped the cutter's torch. Nine locomotives survived, saved by a combination of foresight, luck, and the growing determination of preservationists. Evening Star, the last built, had been earmarked for preservation from the moment it left Swindon in 1960, its commemorative green paint signaling a different fate. The others owed their survival to quick-thinking volunteers, fundraising drives, and a sense that something irreplaceable was slipping away. For the men who had fired and driven these engines, and for the volunteers who fought to save them, the loss was deeply personal. They spoke of engines scrapped in perfect running order, of skills and camaraderie rendered obsolete overnight. In the end, the 9F's legacy rested on these few survivors, iron proof that utility and excellence could not always shield a machine from policy, but that memory and effort could sometimes rescue it from oblivion. Today, railway innovation faces the same tension between convention and progress. The Class 9F story reminds us that performance can be buried by policy and potential can be dismissed by momentum. As technology cycles accelerate, what else are we sidelining before it is fully understood? Sometimes what looks obsolete is just ahead of its time. Join the conversation below. What modern innovations are we overlooking?